Uh, I am going to make three points, and uh, two of those are essentially background ones, and then the third one is longer and is mostly economic. So the very first point is about what is uh, Western uh, Balkans. This is not a political geography or economic geography concept. It's basically a group of countries connected by, or countries that share common security risks. It's perceived like, it was perceived like that by the EU and also locally. So in a way, the whole EU process or process of enlargement to the Western Balkans not to the rest of the Balkans, has been driven by these security dynamics. In my opinion, that was initially the mistake that was made by the EU and uh, others that uh, were determining this process of enlargement as essentially internally driven, as countries graduate from their animosities, they uh, then satisfy conditions to start the process of EU enlargement. So that's the first point I want uh, to make. It's not uh, a mystery, so to speak, that this has been a rather long process uh, with not uh, necessarily uh, very successful results. And that's my second point I want to make. I was involved very much in the preparation of the Thessaloniki summit with uh, then Greek friends and uh, some local governments, especially the then government of Serbia. And it was clear from the very beginning that it is a process that will disappoint because the level of commitment that both the local governments, but also the EU was ready to invest in this process was relatively low. So we have not been in that sense surprised that 10 years hence, we actually have one country uh, joining the EU and all the other countries are very far away from joining the EU. So that's the second point uh, I want uh, to make. Now, the third point is about economics. The first five or so years after the, uh, after the Thessaloniki uh, meeting were very good from an economic point of view. In these very good circumstances, uh, let's say from 2003, 2004 to 2008, just before the crisis, we have seen a relatively dynamic growth in, in this region and also throughout the Balkans, including Greece. Uh, the quality of this uh, growth has, however, been such that it has been developing a lot of vulnerabilities that were recognized at the time. Uh, current account deficits or external imbalances, fiscal imbalances, but most of all, employment imbalances. This, is, this, this was not an employment generating process. It was also industry destructive process. So there was a deindustrialization de going on. The, the hope was that this is the first phase that will be then su uh, superseded by a, a process in which then the, gross, the, the uh, production capacities will increase, employment will increase, and so on. And that was presumed on actually be this region by some time becoming the the, the, the member states of the EU. However, in this pr uh, period, what you see is actually deterioration of this region, intra-regional uh, political and, uh, and uh, 
in intergovernmental relationship, especially in in, uh, the, in respect of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, in, in, the, in, the issue, in the question of the Macedonian issue, and in uh, uh, Serbia. So the process uh, after Thessaloniki for about five or so years actually uh, disappointed also in that sense that the political developments, some of which are with, with us still, have been actually going backwards. You had a greater chance of solving the Bosnian problem in 2003, 4, and 5 than you have now. That may change tomorrow, but at the moment, that's how it is. And similarly, it, it was easier, it seemed to me, we were close to solving the Macedonian problem than we are now, and so on. So from an economic point of view, uh, the, the, the crisis was very detrimental because this process uh, was interrupted at the point when the vulnerabilities were at the highest and the, the, the instruments were at the lowest. So we have now a situation in the Balkans, not just Western Balkans, throughout the Balkans, uh, and perhaps even in, in, in a few other countries close to the Balkans, that the whole strategy of growth has to be changed with relatively limited policy instruments that are available to these countries. And I'll just go through this limited policy space that these countries have. When you look at usual policy instruments, they are almost not available to these countries. If you look at the monetary policy, most of these countries are actually using euro. So monetary policy is basically disabled. You can say that, I don't know, Bosnia has a currency and Serbia has a currency, but that's only in name. Basically, these, these countries use euro as a, as a currency. So monetary policy is extremely uh, restricted. In theory, you could change that, but given that businesses, households, everybody has chosen euro, that is not, not an easy uh, trick to do. So that's one issue. On the fiscal policy issue, these are ex very constrained, fiscally very constrained countries. Uh, they have, some of them, had a similar fate as Ireland, being actually initially uh, fiscal uh, public debt being relatively low initially, but now ballooning because of the overall uh, decline or collapse in in the corporate sector and also in or a huge increase in uh, unemployment, which obviously drives uh, a lot of social transfers. So now most of these countries, certainly Croatia, even more probably Serbia, also Montenegro and so on, in, not to mention Bosnia, ha have a very limited fiscal space in order to do something to stimulate uh, the economy. This also is, of course, the case of, of Greece, as, as we all know. So this is a basically a Balkan issue, if it is not a more general issue. And so if you read, for instance, yesterday's uh, comment by IMF on Serbia, you see what the problem is. Monetary policy cannot act before fiscal policy doesn't act, and fiscal policy has to act in a dramatic manner. And then you need to have structural reforms to spur growth, which means if you imp the implication of that is you have more about three to four years recession looking ahead of you. That's basically the implication of that. So these are, this is the, the, the policy, uh, pol uh, fiscal policy space. Obviously, membership to EU actually helps in these respects, but uh, uh, this is not in the cards. The third issue, is, the third policy is industrial policy. As I said, these are countries that 
either haven't developed industry or have deindustrialized. Industrial policy is, requires significant institutional capacity to be uh, efficiently uh, implemented. Usually, when you look at uh, even econometrically, you find that countries that have institutional capacity, they have successful, or let's say, at, at least not unsuccessful industrial policies. Uh, countries with relatively bad, not to say corrupt institutions, tend to actually misuse industrial policy. So if you look at the Balkans, I think the, the, the limitations of what you can expect from industrial policies are clear. Now, the employment policy, if you look at the numbers uh, of employed people in the Balkans, these, these are miserable. If you look at the numbers of unemployed people, they are, they are frightening. So the so overall social stability in the Balkans is a very serious issue, especially if now these nationalistic clashes uh, uh, disappear, one hopes that will happen, then there will be a social issue uh, uh, to deal with. Now, there is very little that these countries are doing on employment policy, and there is a limited ability for them to do so. The main, so far, policy has been basically a passive one, unemployment benefits and retirement, which is a problem in itself because you have a huge number of retired people who are a drag on the pension system and uh, you don't have uh, uh, very much uh, anything in terms of active uh, labor mar market, market policies and also there is a huge issue of education. I have no time for that. And finally, the regional is, uh, policy. Uh, there is always a hope that the region could get together and, and have some regional, regional uh, push. This was the idea that was behind the creation of the SEFTA, the idea essentially being the Euro EU one, not a local regional one. SEFTA was essentially pushed on the region, which actually is one of these good uh, external interventions. <laughs> Uh, and what you, uh, what you see uh, there is that the trade barriers, when they are taken out, which in terms of tariffs they have been with the SEFTA agreement, they tend to be superseded but by non-tariff and non-trade barriers. So the hope was that you are creating a larger market, which would be important for investors, and then you could... Uh, uh, then you could actually expect uh, uh, investments uh, that will drive the growth of the, of the region. Uh, that has been stopped by and large uh, by non-tariff and, and non-trade barriers. That, so that may happen in the future, but th th this, th again, it's a very limited space uh, uh, there. So if you look at all these uh, things uh, together, it is really a, a region which uh, would need some major economic reconsideration, some major economic policy reconsideration on the part of the EU. It would be clearly necessary, especially because, and this is my closing uh, point, is that if you look at the first five years after 2003, you see a hope that this region will develop on foreign direct investment or foreign investment in general, because that was essentially the growth model that EU was, and EU was exporting. This is not what you can expect for the next five years. Foreign investments in the region are falling. In fact, money is running out of the region, mostly. So there is a need for a rather basic research, re re rethinking about uh, this whole thing. And I think it would be useful if the EU would start looking at this 
region as an economic rather than a security problem. Thank you very much.